Hi and welcome. Uh, my name is Sebastian König. Um, before I start, maybe one question. Who of you knows Blender not? Aha. Okay. Who of you doesn't know the, the concept of open movies? Who of you didn't see Tears of Steel? Aha. That's good. So I don't have to redo my presentation. That's great. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, how to do short films with Blender, uh, especially VFX short films. Um, and I will do that by showing you how we did Tears of Steel. So Tears of Steel is a short film by the Blender Foundation. And maybe just very quickly, in case uh, you didn't see it, just the very first seconds, just so that you have an uh, impression. There is sounds. Four, three, yeah. two, one. Jerk dumb. Look, Celia, we have to follow our passions. You have your robotics, and I just want to be awesome in space. Why don't you just admit that you're freaked out by my robot hand? Ah. So that's the main plot. So it's a boy and a girl, and they are having troubles. Uh, maybe I don't uh, tell you the whole story. You can just uh, watch it on YouTube. So I'm going to about talk about Tears of Steel and how to produce a short movie with Blender. Um, and since this is supposed to be a workshop, but we have only one hour and you don't have your workstations with you, um, I'm not going to start with technical demonstrations. I will just uh, tell you a little bit about the open movies, how our production went, uh, how the pipeline looked like, maybe what's the special thing if you do it with Blender and open source software. And after that, um, I will do some demos to just to show you how this would look like if you would actually do it. So the open movies are very interesting concept. They started in 2006. Um, so open movie means you can uh, share everything. So you can watch it for free on YouTube. You can download the, the footage, you can download uh, the movie, you can basically you can download everything. And not only the movie, you can also get the assets, all the blend files, everything. You can look into the blend files, see how the composites work, how the robot works, how all the characters uh, look like and stuff like that. So you can do everything with it. Um, you can even use it for your own commercial purposes. So it's really completely and totally open. And also the production is open. So that means we, have a, we had a blog and we were posting about everything we did. Also about all the stuff that we didn't know because we were uh, noobs, especially in terms of uh, shooting and filming. So we didn't do that before. So yeah, we just shared everything. Uh, the open movies are uh, short films, and since they are free, um, we have to get some money for that. And they are financed by crowdfunding. And I think they were actually one of the earliest projects who did crowdfunding. So there's a pre-sale for the DVDs, then people can buy the DVD, and um, then we can actually start doing the movie. And once the movie's done, the people get their DVD, and that's how we finance... Um, the movie. And because everything is open and free, um, you don't really get rich by doing that. So why would you do it then? I mean, what's the point? So there are several points, actually. Um, one of them is that Blender wasn't always open source. Um, it used to be in-house software for uh, a studio uh, in the Netherlands for Neo Geo. And um, because it was used in production, it was really well tested. So if you use the software and develop it yourself, then of course you, knew, you know what you're doing and you know where the bugs are and what doesn't work. So it was really well tested. But then for various reasons, um, 
Blender became open source in 2003. Um, and since then, the development happens um, in the Blender Institute in Amsterdam, but also, of course, online. So everyone can get the source code and uh, contribute to the uh, software. So uh, it's a very open approach to software making. Um, and uh, uh, that means that there is no centralized place where you test the things. Um, and that's why uh, the Blender Foundation founded the, um, the Blender Institute in Amsterdam and they, um, they did these open movies. So the, the, the thing is that you, you have uh, several uh, artists and developers in one room or at least in one building and they have to produce a movie in within six or eight months or so. So you have a real production environment, so it's not just some concept that some coder says, okay, this is a nice piece of code, it works, awesome, let's put it into Blender, but uh, if you actually test it, then you will find that it maybe doesn't work in scenario A or B. So you get feedback uh, if stuff works or not, and um, that uh, also gives you a faster development. And it's fun. And... Um, yeah, so, okay, so this, is, this all happens in the Blender Institute in Amsterdam. This is the institute, this is how we work. So there are, this is from the production of Tears of Steel that happened uh, last year. So there are six artists, um, some workstations, and in the next room there are the coders. So if something doesn't work, you can just walk over and kick them really hard until they make it work. Or uh, you can say, just, dude, I need rotoscoping right now. Do it. And then they do it. And next day you have it. Ideally. <laughs> Almost. Um, so the first open movie was Elephant's Dream in 2006. Um, then we had Big Buck Bunny. And I think it was in 2008. I didn't uh, check the numbers. So if 2011, Sintel. And uh, last year, Tears of Steel. Then every open movie had a certain focus for the development. So of course, it was the one part is always the movie, and the other thing is improve Blender. Um, so there was uh, a focus for every movie. And Elephant's Dream focused on the animation system that was recoded and um, brought us the, the no Note compositor, the first version. Then Big Bug Bunny was hair and fur, and cute fluffy animals. Then Sintel, um, and Sintel was used to develop uh, Blender 2.5. So a total recode of the software. Um, and then Tears of Steel was used for, uh, to develop the tools that you need for visual effects. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about Tears of Steel. So it's an open VFX short film, and it's uh, a work in progress. Um, so this spring, or actually I think the, they, they're still working on it, so currently there's the 4K version that is being produced in Amsterdam, so it's still going, um, and yeah, and that was for visual effects. So if you start doing a visual effects movie, then even if you do uh, commercial, or if, you, if you use uh, commercial software, uh, you need to have a plan. What do you do? So of course it starts with concept art, or before you have a plot. Okay, so plot, then concept art, um, then you start storyboarding. There has to be an animatic so that you know what happens. Um, then if you do an uh, animation film, this of course doesn't need uh, uh, to be done. So, but for visual effects you have to do the shooting and you have to plan for that. You have to prepare, pre prepare all the props and get actors and everything uh, organized. Uh, then uh, after the shooting you have to prepare the footage, you have to do motion tracking, masking, uh, layout for the files, keying, um, animation, and compositing and color grading. So all this has to be done and almost everything can be done in Blender or at least in open uh, software. Not everything, unfortunately, but most of it can be done. So that's, that's the plan, what uh, had to be done. 
and of course we wanted to have an open pipeline because it was an open movie, so of course we didn't use After Effects for compositing, we had to use Blender. Um, also the concept art was done not with Blender but with Krita and the GIMP. So the concept artist David Revoir did some concepts for us and some uh, sketches. Um, and of course, I mean, you don't need Photoshop for this. You can just use any painting program that you want. So of course, we use Krita and the GIMP. Um, then the next step is storyboarding. Uh, and that was the point where David and Ian, uh, Ian, our director, um, came together and started actually doing storyboarding. They also rewrote the story a little bit. Um, um, yeah, so these are some storyboard concepts. And then ne the next thing is you have to have an animatic. So once you have the storyboard, you pin it to the wall and it looks very nice, but you don't see it in motion yet. So um, for, for the movie, of course, you have to do some planning. Um, you have to do the timing. You have to maybe even test some dialogues uh, or get some, uh, some soundtrack already. So for that, of course, we could use a Final Cut or Premiere, but of course we don't. So we use the video sequence editor of Blender. Um, and that's how this would look like. So you have your, uh, your preview of the storyboard, you have everything nicely arranged in the sequence editor. There you can arrange every picture of the storyboard and get the timing right. So maybe I can show you how that would look like in Blender. So this is the sequence editor. You have a preview, or you can zoom in and out, you have to, of course, you have to see the image. And then you have this um, timeline where you can uh, drag and move your images and, well, you can do everything that you would do in a video sequence editor. So, of course, that's very nice because you don't have to leave Blender, you can stay here and do all the stuff. Um, and the good thing about this is that since this is in Blender, you can reuse this file for the step that comes after the storyboard, or the um, uh, animated storyboard, and that's the animatic with actual characters. And since this is just OpenGL rendering, we usually call it the crappy-matic, because the guys look like this, so we didn't have the actors yet, but we knew how they should look like. So we just got very simple versions of the characters that could be created very quickly. Um, they, uh, they could be animated. So this is how we would plan a scene. Of course, without sound, but at least it's enough to, uh, to get the timing, to know what they are doing, how this would look like uh, if you would film this. Um, so that's a very nice tool to, uh, to plan the production. And um, why did I go? Okay. So the other thing is um, that you can do in Blender, of course, is to plan your sets. So if you know you, you're going to do a green screen filming, then still you have to know how you would build your set, how this would look like. Um, so we could just very easily um, quickly model this and then place these dummy characters in the green screen and see how this would look like if you would film this. And the nice thing is that we can use these uh, OpenGL renderings and put them in the sequencer as well to, uh, to even have a better timing. But not only that, we don't even have to pre-render. We can just put the scenes directly into the sequencer. So maybe if I go to the, um, to the edit, we have the previous edit. It takes a while to load because it has to load all the scenes. So again, you have the sequence editor, you can have your strips, you can duplicate them, move them around, you can do everything that you would do with a video. But the nice thing is that this is actually live 3D viewport. So you can cut with your 3D scenes without having to re-render. Um, you can even do... Uh, um, 
reverse frame or speed effects. So if you want to have this faster or slower, you can just add this uh, effect and edit your 3D file live here in the sequence editor. Of course, on a tiny laptop, this is not really that fast in real time, but if you have a nice workstation, then uh, you can actually edit your 3D files. And in this blend file, I have all these linked scenes. So I could also go to a different screen layout where I have the 3D viewport and not only the sequence editor, and can um, open the scenes and see how they look like. You could even animate them from here. So if I look through the camera now, you have all the guys here. I think uh, I could even move them around. So I can take this, and this is an entire set or an entire scene, and all these scenes are linked. So even though uh, you have them here, you can see the camera, um, I cannot edit them from here. I would have to go to the blend file that's loaded or linked into this scene. So we have all these different scenes. So I could just open anything here, maybe not this one, um, I don't know. Maybe this. Uh, and th these are the scenes that are loaded and linked into the sequence editor. And here we can uh, actually move stuff around and uh, prepare the animation. So for, for previous, that's really nice and useful. And that allowed us to, uh, to get a really good idea of how the timing would be. Um, and as I've said, the, uh, the not only the scenes are linked, everything is linked. So if you have the scene, you, not, you don't really put the characters inside the, inside the scene, you link your character. So we, we had all these different elements, the props, the environments, the characters, and they are all linked into, for example, shot one. And shot one is then linked into this animatic, into this previous edit that you just saw. And not only shot one, but all the other shots are all linked into this animatic. And that's a very nice and tidy workflow. Um, and that allowed us to have a really good idea of how the movie would look like later. Uh, yeah, I've already showed you this. So this is how this looked like. Of course um, you're ready. You're a rock the star. The top left, <laughs> you have the storyboards, then How's the crappy matic. We should have about the 10 minutes. green screen footage and then the final well, result. that's perfect. We're only one. All systems go. Yeah, you go. Go. Move your asses. Go, go, go. I love it. Come on. Go. That's nice. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. Tough. So. Incredibly useful. So this was all pre-production, and um, while the animators and the director were doing the, the crappy matic and the storyboards and all that kind of stuff, um, the modelers uh, started to create the, the actual production models, the robot, uh, the environment, um, and all these things. And then we had the production. So pre-production was March to April, and then in May, the shooting came along. So we also had the actors. Um, and well, we, we, we had no idea. We really, I didn't do this before. So the only person who was actually doing visual effects was our director, Ian Hubert. Um, so we had no idea. He knew what he was doing. So he, he even did a feature film, Project London also with visual effects, um, but I would say more on an indie level. I mean, it's a very nice film, but they didn't really use a big camera, so it was all low budget. I mean, we were also low budget, but at least we wanted to do it pro. Get a kick-ass camera. So we got the Sony F50, no, 65, with an 8K sensor with a real shutter. So. Awesome. By the time we were the, doing the shooting, there were only two cameras from this in entire Europe, so we were really quite fancy. And if you have such a great camera, then you don't just grab it and film it yourself. We wanted to have a badass DP. So we got 
Joris Kerbosch, and uh, it was very helpful. And then we wanted to have a giant green screen studio, so we got that too. And of course, this is all, this is all expensive, so all our money, the pre-production, pre-sale DVD money just burned away. But well, that's what happens if you want to have a giant green screen studio. And we wanted to get a Wechsleebrechling. So basically, we wanted to have our own parking space for the crane that we were using. Um, so we had one week or one day reserved for us. Um, and of course, let's film in the red light district. I mean, we are in Amsterdam, so of course, we do it there. And, but we actually had a reason, because the, the movie takes place at the De Oude Kerk in Amsterdam, and this is in the Red Light District. It's a very famous church with a bridge that you can see in the lower right corner. And this is where the, these two main actors, Tom and Celia, they were breaking up there. So the, the entrance scene that was supposed to be filmed here. So, of course, you, you get your Sony F65 and your uh, DP and your lighting and the crane and all the stuff, and you put it in the middle of the red light district. Well, so we had no idea, um, but luckily um, we not only got a green screen studio and the stuff, we also got um, an assistant director, a gaffer, and the DP. And these guys weren't noobs, they really knew their stuff, so they could tell us maybe it's not the best idea to put all this into the red light district. Camera, red light district, maybe not the best idea. So they suggested to, to move to another bridge um, that was in a very quiet area of Amsterdam, um, where we also got the Wechsleebrecheling, so we put the crane there. But even there, it was really a quiet, nice and lonely bridge, but even there, uh, we really had to do to, to keep the people from running over our set. So even Ton Rosendahl, the main uh, founder and programmer of Blender, he had to, to block the guys. And even then, the people managed to get behind our actors when we were filming, so we had to rotate them out which is a nice exercise, of course, but, well, it sucked. Um, well, so we had this green screen studio and was so big and so large that we said, okay, that's easy, there's, well, we have the actors and the camera, and then what else? But then when, uh, when the people came, the, the gaffer, the light guy, the grip, the, the focus puller, and all these guys suddenly filling up the studio, putting up the dolly and the light, and uh, everything was so crowded, we had no idea. So this is how it looked like first, and then very quickly it turned into such a mess. Uh, it was amazing. And since we didn't do this before, it was really like we were just sitting there, wow, what happens? But it was really interesting. Um, so and my job was to, um, to take care of the, the tracking. So later on I was doing the match moving. So on, on set I had to place the markers there. Then um, I had to note down the focal length of the, of the camera so that I can uh, track that better and take all this data, transfer it to later to our production sheet where we knew th this scene was using this um, how do you say, the clap, clapperboard number, uh, it went into this and that folder, and we had this and that focal length, so all the information had to be gathered, and I wasn't really prepared for that. Um, so I had to run around uh, through all this mess and try to uh, get an idea which focal length would be uh, used for uh, some certain shots. Um, and I had to place the markers. I don't know if... Yeah, you can actually see them. So behind the ladder, you can maybe see some markers there. Then, of course, on the ladder, there are markers. Then there is this interesting device that uh, the actor is holding. That's the arm gun. So this is our tracking device, so that we could uh, get an object track and later replace that with a fancy plasma gun. Um, yeah, and, and this was a handheld shot. Everything went very quickly, so I was just panicking and 
hoping that all the markers would be in the right position um, and that nothing went wrong. Uh, and all that in all this mess. So that was really interesting. Uh, I had to put markers on the wall as well. And since uh, we had one set that was on a little stage, I had to also put some markers very high. Another thing that I wasn't really prepared for, so I grabbed these wooden sticks and placed the marker tape uh, on the tip and uh, tried to place the markers there, but they would fall off because this was not a wall, this was just a piece of cloth, so the markers didn't stick, and everything between two shots, so I was freaking out. <laughs> <coughs> but there is a lesson to be learned from this. Um, don't run on set. This is something that I did wrong. And if you ever do uh, special effects or visual effects supervising, be prepared for the mess. Uh, also hire an assistant director, so without her I would have been so lost. Um, and don't panic. Good advice. Um, so that was uh, the shooting. That was really interesting. Um, we had four days, um, three days in the green screen studio and one day on set on this bridge. Um, yeah, and then everything was packed into little packages and everything went home. So we were done. And then the next problem came and that was we had to deal with the footage. Because you have this camera and then you have these cards and you have to put these cards into a black box. No one really knows what's happening there, but it spits out data. But of course, not through a cable, you have to go through the network. So we had to get our developers to look at this um, web interface of this uh, black box with the footage inside. And then we had to somehow transfer that to the hard drives. And then what? Then you have the footage, um, and it's supposed to be a super fancy 32-bit um, float, high dynamic range, um, um, and the format was linear ACES, which is supposed to be a very big color space, so very good. But then we, when we put this into Blender, it looked very dull and very flat and very horrible. Um, and then we just went and asked the, pu the public what to do with it. And then they said, yeah, you, you need open color I.O., um, which is also from, uh, I believe, Sony Imageworks. And this is supposed to be, oh, this was supposed to be integrated into Blender. So by the time we didn't have color management, so we had to use a Python script. And through Python, we could then convert the footage to something that looked much better. So from this to this, that was very nice. Um, so we converted all the footage um, to this color space. And it was a very tedious workflow. So all the different shots, then all the footage into different folders, then put them from one, one folder to the other through open color IO. We also had to use, unfortunately, the Sony image viewer software for that, which also wasn't really that nice. But anyway, somehow we managed to export all the footage and then we could go on. So that was post-production, and for post-production we needed a few new tools. So Blender already had nice modeling tools, some, something for texturing, the sequence editor and all that stuff, but for visual effects you need some certain tools that we didn't have by the time. So of course, tracking and match moving. When we started with the movie, we just had it um, for one year, um, and was very nice and usable. We did have some keying tools, but not that great. So this was something to be developed still. Masking and rotoscoping didn't exist. A new multi-threaded uh, compositor, because we were supposed to do 4K later, and then if you do 4K, you really need a decent compositor, which we also didn't have. And photorealistic rendering and color grading. So all these tools still had to be developed um, and we succeeded, so we got all these tools. That's great, because now I have something to demo. Um, so maybe are there questions so far or any 
Good. Then I will do a little demo. Um, and I thought maybe I'd just show you some tracking, a little bit of keying, a little bit of masking, a little bit of compositing, a little bit of everything. So we have 20 minutes. Let's see what we can do. Are there any special things that you would like to see? Or should I just... Roto match moving? Okay, let's do it. So first, oh, I have to get to the default theme so that you don't get confused. So um, reset to default theme. I don't know, is this, yeah, this is actually a good projector so you can see everything, right? Or should I incre make it bigger? Good. Right, so, well, we started everything with match moving. We could have also used keying, but keying and um, um, tracking somehow overlaps, so we always started with uh, match moving. So if you do match moving in Blender, you, um, you go to the motion tracking interface uh, with a big screen, so this is where you open up your shots. So let me go to the folder with some footage. So maybe this one, let's start simple. Um, so this is obviously something for keying, but the camera is moving a little bit. So if I go through the shot, you can see it's a little bit of movement. You don't really need a camera track, but at least one fixed point so that you can put something in the background. So if you do this in Blender, first I would go full screen maybe, so that I have a little bit more room to work with. Um, and for tracking, it's good to have everything in the memory. Of course, you can work from the hard drive, but that's a little bit slow. So first, I would press P for prefetch. Uh, by the way, this will be something that is new uh, in Blender 2.67 that is supposed to come out, I think, in two weeks or so. Um, so now I'm loading everything into memory. You can see down here this purple line. Everything is caching. And once everything is cached, I would search for one marker um, that I can track. I could use the lamp, but if I go through the shot, the lamp is shaking like crazy. But in the background, there is one little red dot. So we had these pink... This was one of the markers that I had to put with a stick. Uh, so that's very, a very high marker. It's a pink cross of uh, strips. But since of the, uh, because of the motion blur, everything is... Uh, sorry, because of the depth of field, it's totally blurry, and you can hardly see it. So that's why the first thing would be to search for the markers, and because this is a green screen, I would just disable some channels, and if I disable the blue channel, or maybe first, first black and white, then disable the blue channel, and there's almost no information in here, so this doesn't really change much. But if I also disable the green channel, ooh, there's suddenly this red point that I can track. So I would control left click here to place a marker, um, make the marker a little bit bigger maybe, so we have this giant point, and this tiny marker, so I would scale it up just by pressing S for a scale. And currently I'm just seeing um, in the preview this black and white image, but the marker is still using the full color range. So I could also go to the track panel and disable two channels for the tracking point and then press Control T to start the tracking and it will go through the shot and um, the footage is a little bit crappy because this is an export uh, of uh, JPEG images of usually it would be uh, open EXR files. So this has some compression artifacts, but still the tracking went quite nicely, I would say. You can also lock the footage to the marker. So if I now go through the shot, it looks not, yeah, rather stable. Okay, so this would be already enough for some um, for something that we can put in the background. So I would go to the compositor because now we are basically done with the tracking. So I could set up a keying node and maybe a background image that we can put in the background. 
So from the motion tracking interface, I would go to compositing, uh, use the nodes, of course, and the default setup is we have the render layer and the composite output. Since there is nothing in the 3D viewport to render, I can just delete this and instead um, bring up my tool shelf, which is also new in Blender 2.67. So from, from here, I can drag in my movie clip. Um, and if I look at this, this is, of course, the clip. Uh, maybe make it a little bit smaller. So I could go to the resolution panel and first, because this is, um, this is not actually HD, this is a different resolution. Uh, the, the 4K is scaled down to HD, um, would be 10, 1012 pixels high. Um, maybe just use 50%, so that compositing is a little bit faster. So first I would um, scale this down to the render size. Um, like so, and then let's have a look at the keying node. So keying you would find in MAT, and the very first one is the keying node, so I just drag this in and place it on the line. Um, pick a color with the color picker, like so. Um, we can actually average between different colors, so if I click and drag here, this will pick up all the different shades of green and average them. So we should have a nice starting point. And if I look at the matte channel, it's a little bit crappy. So I have to clip the blacks and the whites. Ideally, I would use two keying nodes, maybe one for this area around the hair so that we keep the detail here. And then another, maybe more aggressive keying node for, for the outside. Um, but for now, I would just keep it like this. Uh, increase the contrast. Maybe to get rid of some of these problems here, this sharp line down here, I could use some feathering, like so. Um, and if I have a look at the image, it looks totally horrible. Um, but that has to do with um, this just a display problem. Uh, if I activate the alpha channel, everything looks all right again. Or if I just want to look at the RGB channels without the alpha, I can disable use alpha in the viewer node and then also everything looks much better. So this image is not pre-multiplied yet. Um, I guess some of you know what pre-multiplying is. And for those who don't, I won't explain because we would sit here tomorrow still. Um, basically, I can just drag in a converter, alpha convert to pre-multiply that. Then I can also dis uh, enable the use alpha button again. Um, so yeah, so this is almost an almost nice key. Um, so we could put it onto some background. Um, to make it a little bit more interesting, let's not use a plain color, but an image. So I would open up an image here. Um, so this is an image from Tears of Steel, from one of the background plates. Um, so I could just place this on top of that. Um, and don't worry if this is too large. This will be, once this is uh, rendered in the composite output, this will be clipped. Uh, but the compositor will show you everything that is there. So to make this look a little bit nicer, of course, I would have to blur the background to make it look a little bit more realistic. So I go to the blur node and maybe do a 1% Gaussian blur, like so. It's not perfect, but nice enough for a demo. So if I now cycle through the different frames, then the background is static, of course. And that's a problem. So what we did in Tears of Steel was to actually do a tripod track um, so that we had a moving camera and put a plane in the background. But um, the more hackish way would be to just move the background around with just one marker. And we did the track for this one marker already. So I can bring in the track position. And from, from, the, from this panel, from the track position menu, I can pick the marker that we had been using and use the X and Y coordinates for that. So maybe even before blurring, or let's do it after blurring. I could 
uh, move the background plate around with a translate or with a transform node and just pipe in the x and y coordinates here, like so. Um, set the position to relative start frame. And now if I cycle through the frames, you can see the background is actually moving, just like our marker was also moving. So the background plate will do the same movement as this one marker. And that should be enough for, uh, for the scene. So that would be the composite. And after that, of course, you could do some color grading if you want. Um, Usually, uh, we had been doing the color grading in the, in the sequence editor, but uh, yeah, it's also possible to do it here. So this is um, the very basic keying workflow. If I would do masking for this shot, I could, uh, I could well, let's go to mask mode and just draw a mask around his head, like so. Um, maybe so that we have a nice a uh, smooth outline, shift click on one of these points and drag out a feather area. Maybe even make the whole thing a bit smaller, maybe like so. Unfortunately, we cannot really have a preview right there in the movie clip editor. That's not so nice. But we can again use the compositor to have a look at the mask. So if I drag out the mask node, this is our mask and um, well, we could use it to maybe combine two different keying nodes. Um, I think I won't do it, or maybe I... Hmm. Because I want to do some other things as well. So maybe let's not use this mask. Instead, let's, um, let's get rid of all the crap on the left. Let's do this. Let's make this mask a little bit bigger. Um, like so. And then the feather area here should be maybe a little bit smaller. Yeah, good enough. So this would be that. Um, and now I can combine the output of this mask node with my mat channel, or maybe even just pipe it directly into the keying node as, let's say, garbage mat, but uh, of course uh, the other way around. So I can just invert the color and have now everything else separated. So now we only have the guy in front of the background without the lamp and the other guy. I wouldn't even call this rotoscoping. For rotoscoping, this would have to be much more precise. Um, but since I want to show also some other things, this should be enough for the masking um, demo. Maybe just very quickly. Uh, you can have multiple masks, so I can have uh, another mask maybe for for this guy, just in case I want to use them, um, I want to use him as well. So I could um, draw this mask, and in the compositor, um, I can have another mask output, and use that one. So that you can have multiple masks, and this is how you would do it. Um, for this shot, this should be enough um, because I want to demo some more tracking. Unless there are questions to this topic. Good. Then, new blend file. I'll also switch the, oops, the theme back to the default. So let's open up another shot from Tears of Steel, so that would be this one. And again, I will press P for prefetch. Um, everything is cached into the RAM and I can preview. And again, we have a very, very simple camera movement. So this would, probably this would be even good enough for, uh, for a one-point track just for the background, but um, just to demo, I want to do a tripod solve from this. Uh, for a tripod, especially if you have such an easy shot like this one, I can just maybe... Let's make the pattern size a little bit larger. Let's say 30 pixels. So let me zoom in here. So you have the, the pattern size. 
in Blender's Match Moving module. So this is this, this is the pattern, and you have the search area. There is a button for the search, but there's also a hotkey, Alt-S, you can just toggle that. So if you have a very fast motion, then you should have a very big search area. If the motion is very smooth, like in our, uh, in our movement here, the search area can be much smaller and tracking will be uh, faster. And in the tracking settings, you can set a preview, uh, sorry, a preset, so that every new marker that I place here will use the same properties. And for tripod, I think um, three markers would probably be already enough, but just in case, let's put some markers here in the scene, um, and then press Control T to track them from frame. Wow. Let's track them backwards, which is also possible. And in this case, this is really so easy that I don't have to do it one by one. So they are all more or less doing the correct motion. One of them is jittering. You can use the graph view for that. So if there are spikes like this, I would just uh, erase the spikes or just erase the entire marker. Because for tripod, this would be really enough. The movement, movement is so little that this is very easy. OK, so we have all these markers tracked. So now I want to have a camera solve. So to make Blender solve this camera motion, uh, I have to tell Blender about the camera that I've been using. And this was the Sony F65, and that has a certain sensor size, which is 24.33. That's the sensor size of this camera. And the other thing that is very important is the focal length. That's why I've been taking all these notes on set so that I could tell Blender which focal length this is. And it was definitely not 16. I think it was something around 40. And with this information, Blender should be able to track the camera rotation. So if I go to tripod solving mode, and maybe let's refine the focal length even to make it a bit more precise. You can just press a button, and it's done. So Blender has solved the camera rotation with a solve error of 0 0.3. That means the difference between the actual 3D points and the track markers is less than one pixel. It's just 0 0.3 pixels wide, so it's quite accurate. Um, yeah, next thing, 3D. So I would go to the 3D viewport, and so far I see nothing. So the camera is just static. Um, in order to make this work, I have to first assign the camera solver. So I would go to the properties, and in the constraints panels, I can add the solver, and suddenly I can see these uh, little crosses here. And if I look through the camera, I can assign this as a background plate, and if I press Alt-A, I will have the playback, uh, and can see if everything works. And that's also the beauty of having everything in one software, because you don't have to import, export. You just press a button, and it's there. You can modify it and work with it as much as you want. No import, export. And that's really, really nice. For example, what if I want to align the, uh, the camera with the 3D scene here? Uh, I can, of course, do some reconstruction math setup thing. Or I just set. Um, my cursor to the pivot point of my scene and rotate around this point uh, and, uh, until I have something that works more or less. It's definitely not perfect, but maybe it will do for now. Something like this. Maybe if the cube... Like a little more like this. So maybe if I say... <coughs> Let's not use a cube. Let's put something on the plane, uh, on the wall in the background. So this will now stick to the wall, and that's nice. But that's not interesting, really. I mean, tripod solving is basic and boring. Yes? Uh, can you uh, constrain uh, the points to a specific axis? Yeah, that would be so nice. Well, 
you sort of can um, if there is an actual uh, 3D source. This is just a rotating camera, so there is not real depth information there. Um, if you have um, a real camera that is located in space and moving, then you can pick three points to define a floor plane. But it's not really constrained. It will just use the current camera solve and put it there. But if you resolve something, it might go away again. So you would have to put it there again. That's something on the menu for the next steps. So hopefully this Google Summer of Code 2013, we might get uh, 3D constraints, but so far this is a little bit tedious because you, you can put it there, but if you resolve, you might have to reposition it. It sucks, of course. Okay, but so far tripod solving is super easy and boring, so let's do something more interesting. Um, so, as you can see, the, the captain here, he has this eye patch. And if you look closely, you might find that this is a webcam cut in half, wired with some crappy cables and a metal thing. So this looks totally stupid. And we decided um, after the premiere even that this looks too boring. So we wanted to have um, an object that we could place there. And now I have to hurry up. There's just eight minutes left. So this will be a very quick object solve. I hope I can do it. Um, so for an object, of course, you get an object. I don't want to resolve the camera. Next, I just place a marker here and press Control T and see what happens. Well, it fails. No surprise, because uh, the feature that it's tracking is deforming. He's moving his head. The lighting changes. So everything is quite complicated. So instead, I would set up a different preset and use affine tracking. So affine tracking is sort of planar tracking, not really like in Mocha, but still the marker will try to transform with the, uh, with the object in space. So, um, the next thing is normalize to compensate for differences in lighting. Maybe match it to the previous frame instead of some keyframe. And if I now press Ctrl T, it will track the entire frame of the entire footage. If I lock this th through the center, that looks actually quite usable. And I will just repeat this eight times because eight markers are needed for a 3D reconstruction. Ideally, these markers are not all on one plane, but they cover some depth. So his biggish head, I would say, is very well, um, it's a very good thing to, to track. So we, I, we I mean, we didn't put tracking markers on his head. Which would you, you would usually, usually do that if you would approach something like this. But uh, with Blender, you don't need that. You can track hair and skin, and it's just totally awesome. Oh, well, you, you can, but that's super tedious, I think. Yeah. It's if just, you it really. if you really need it, of course. So if I set this back from pre previous frame to keyframe and try this one, then, well, I wanted to, to demo that the markers will at some point lose their point. Well, this is not really stable. So if I find a frame where it's jumping off, I press G to grab it and then have a new keyframe or a new reference point, so to say, and then track from there. But especially for object tracking and uh, footage like this, it really helps to use previous frame or the, the previous frame as a reference because usually that works better, especially with uh, tracking skin like this. Um, that really helps. So hopefully, how many? This is actually already four. Maybe I can do one more here. Um, you can mute the footage to look at the markers. And if you play back, yeah, that looks nice. You can also control the motion curves, and that looks all quite solid. So now the interesting uh, part happens, and that is I have to try to solve this. And 
Um, the most important part usually for solving is to set the keyframes right. The keyframes are the two frames that are used to establish the perspective. And if I look at the markers, then it seems to me that between first frame and this frame, maybe 17 or 19, there is some nice depth. And after 17, it stays there until frame 30, so frame 30 might not be the best. Usually, keyframes are set to 1 and 30. That's why I'm explaining that you might want to set the keyframe B to uh, frame 17. Um, now I solve this. Uh, the solve error is 2.7, which is not great. So you can see here also in my 3D view these markers. Uh, these are the markers of the, uh, of the head. They are somewhere in space. So now I will start finding better keyframes as a reference point. Um, 21, that doesn't really help. And this is the horrible demo effect because in R, ah, 1.0, that's nice. Okay, so they are all moving with the head. So ideally, they also move in the certain axis because sometimes with object tracking it happens that there is some inverted matrix. So the view axis is flipped. And this is something that you can only tell if you use a test object. And of course, we use the Blender mascot, Zuzan. And um, this object would get an object solver constraint um, three minutes left, so fingers crossed, yes, it works, <laughs> awesome. So this is how we track the head. Perfect. So in the last remaining three minutes, I wanted to show you how to insert an object and how to render that, but uh, there is no time for that. Um, but just to uh, finish this, object tracking in Blender is something that I really like because it usually works very nicely. Uh, this supervised tracking approach with affine tracking is very nice for tracking skin and hair and you don't need tracking markers. That's why I like it really a lot. Okay, that's this. And now I quickly finish my talk by showing one breakdown. Yeah. So that's one breakdown. You can also find these on YouTube. Um, and then very quickly, currently the 4K project happens. So the Blender Foundation has a great 4K screen, sort of, um, but it's a very nice project. Um, so the difference between uh, HD and 4K is quite nice because I think this is just uh, the presentation program. This doesn't really, this is not showing you 4K. This is 4K. Again, this is, oops, this is 2K, 4K. So there really is a lot more resolution and it's a lot less forgiving. So now we see all the crap, all the bad keys, all the bad masks, all the crap, so 4K is horrible if you have to do it. It's really a nightmare, especially because uh, Blender is still a little bit slow. Luckily, because of this 4K project, we got the prefetching in the clip editor so that uh, previewing the footage is faster. Uh, we have GLSL playback and uh, GLSL grading. So that's a nice improvement. In the compositor, there's a region of interest, so you can define a little border in which you can uh, do the compositing. Buffer groups, um, also a little bit faster. And other benefits? Well, there's now tons of uh, stuff that you can use for free. The models um, and also the footage. So the footage is available on the web. We have the, the original 4K footage. There's the cleaned footage that's already been masked. Um, the frames that are rendered, everything is there, and you can use it. You can even use it commercially um, and test it. Like, for example, um, 
you might know this guy. So this is the Nuke site. So they are demoing uh, Nuke 7 with Tears of Steel. Awesome. So that's a very nice benefit also for the entire VFX community. So I think um, it could have gone worse, all in all. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>